And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Steve Lavoy, who never knew actual peace and tranquility until his near-death experience in 2000 due to a near-fatal car accident. Steve, thank you for joining me and welcome. Thank you, Jeff. It's good to be here. Well, we are happy to have you, Steve. And if you don't mind, let's start on the day of that car accident and go from there. Okay. Um, August 5th, 2000. I ate a really good, well, before that, went to the bank, cashed my check, went to a restaurant, had a good meal. And then I was driving into town in California uh, to go to a counseling uh, appointment. Driving the speed limit, doing my thing, came to this intersection. The light was green in my favor, but every time I go through an intersection, I always slow it down like one mile. You know, so if anybody's coming through, I can like not, I can stop in time. And so got probably about halfway across the intersection, and I glanced out the left side of my car, and all I saw was headlights. It was daytime, uh, probably approximately 10, 11 o'clock in the morning. Um, so I had headlights of his car, and he hit my driver's door exactly and snow plowed me. Um, my car hit a curb, went wrapped around a telephone pole, and stopped. A a uh, first responder that was on, that was, you know, heard the accident, he ran over, looked in the passenger side window, which was the window that was left open, or actually broke um, from the accident, looked at me, and the lap belt of my car was like pinching me in two. He actually pulled the lap belt out and sliced it. And, you know, release that part of the lap belt. And I somehow went unconscious. And then I heard a person sitting next to me. And I kind of looked over a little bit because I didn't know how badly injured I was. My fingers were still deadlocked on the wheel. And they they had to literally open my fingers up, get me off, get my fingers out of away from the wheel, the steering wheel. Um, it was a paramedic that was next to me. They put a cervical collar on me. And then he told me they were going to put a blanket over me. It's just to protect me from the glass of the driver's door. It was possibly going to break because they were going to use the jaws of life. So I'm like, okay. And I was worried about, there was like steam coming from the engine, but I thought it was smoke. So I said, what about the smoke? He goes, no, it's just steam. Uh, they broke the door away, and somehow I started, like, not so much slipping, but I started, like, going down. And they brought a backboard in, laid me down, taped my head to the backboard as best possible. That was the worst injury I had. And then they put the backboard on a gurney. It was daytime in California. It's sunny. But somehow the sunshine then was very intense. And so I tried to close my eyes and the paramedic said, you got to keep your eyes open. You got to keep awake. Got to keep awake. I said, but the light's too bright. You still have to keep awake, please. So they're wheeling me to the uh, ambulance. and. Of course, when they, they bring a gurney into the ambulance, it bumps in so the back wheels go up. When that happened, I was immediately above the ambulance. Looking at the whole scene around the ambulance, the probation firefighters sweeping up the glass, the police officers all around many blocks around the ambulance diverting traffic away from the accident. Um, I literally saw the power crew coming in to check the pole, which I found out later, the force of my car 
hitting the pole, push the pole in the ground six inches in one direction. It didn't break the pole, but it pushed it. Um, then from there, you ever seen Star Trek with the uh, those paths they stand on, they go to another planet? Yeah. Like zip out. The teleport. Teleport path. Yeah. It was like that. I didn't see a tunnel. I was once like above the ambulance and suddenly, <laughs> and I was in this light. These beings, light beings, I guess, um, I couldn't quite describe them. I, the best I could describe them is it was their souls that I saw. And they looked at me. They didn't speak to me with words like I'm speaking to you. They speak to me like from here and here. So it was kind of like stereo. And they said, follow us. And I'm like, where am I going? Where am I going? And I heard, follow us. And so I'm like, I follow them. And I go into this room. Uh, to best describe it, it's like a huge IMAX with a 360 degree uh, movie screen. But there's no projector. There's absolutely no projector in the room shining on the screen. And they asked me one question. Well, first, before the question, my life flashed on the screen all around me, including back behind me. I could see what was happening behind me, even in crystal clear vision. And I'm watching everything that has happened in my whole life. It was embarrassing. And they asked me one question. They said, who are you? And I told them my name. I told them where I lived. I told them who my friends were. And they shook their head. I said, who are you? All this time, my life review is going on. And I'm watching the people I hit and punched and cussed at and hated and lied to and did everything to, you know. Um, and I told them how much money I had in the bank, what type of car I drove, this, that, and the other thing, where I worked. They went, no, who are you? Now, this time, the images all around me started morphing and I'm like getting freaked by it because I'm starting to see certain things happening. And I told him, I said, hey, I have friends that will that'll back me up. I have this, I have this, I have this. It was all ego I was speaking. And they said, mm, who are you? This time, the, the images morphed. It was like a snap of a morph. So it was like a slow morph in, and then it came into crystal clear vision that if I had a person on the ground and I was punching them, I was punching myself. If I was spitting on a person, I was spitting on myself. Doing anything angry or disrespectful or rude, I was doing it to myself. And I looked around, and when I heard the question, a tear fell from my eye. And I looked up at them and I said, I don't know who I am. And they nodded their head and they said, you are love. And that's all you ever were and are. And that's all you'll ever be. And they said, they said, follow us. And they let us out, me out of the building. And this is the amazing part. The entire sky was filled with billions and billions of rainbows. Right? Not just one rainbow upon another. It was like, it was a rainbow sky, but it was billions of them. Furthermore, each and every single color of the rainbow, like all the blues, 
were singing one tone of the Sofagio tones. So the blues were singing one tone, the yellows were singing another, the purples another, and on and on. And it sounded like a beautiful chorus uh, or a symphony. And I looked at them and I said, I don't want to go back. I've hurt too many people down there. They said, you, you're going back. And you will tell the story and we'll be talking. And that was it. It was like, snap, I'm back in my body down on earth on the trauma table. And it's metal, all I have on is a gown. And I hear this doctor on, the, on my uh, right side, which was the side that was like eggshell crack from the telephone pole that hit me. And he goes, oh, you're back with us. Okay, good. Uh, you're gonna hear some sounds. I'm like, okay, where am I? You're here with us. I'm like, okay. And I heard the sound of him, you know, putting staples in my skull to repair my scalp. And somehow it felt like being in the light was just a short time, but I was rushed into the hospital about 10.30. By the time I got out of the trauma room it was about 3.30 or four o'clock in the afternoon. You know, um, the one thing I found out by while being there, down here we have a duality. She is tall, he is short. You know, this is that and this, you know, all opposites. Up in the light, there's no duality. There's absolutely none. And furthermore, there's no ego. Um, when I came back, Probably about six months after I came back, seven months, I was in ther physical therapy and everything. I was told, um, I was in a dream, all I heard was one word, hello. And I'm like, woke up out of my sleep, I'm looking around the bedroom, there's nobody there, right? You know, I have nobody living with me. There's nobody there. So I go back to sleep. And all I hear is now two words. Hello. Remember. And the whole near-death experience flooded back in my memory. Um, how I found great Peace from it is quite honestly, to best describe it, in the word namaste, the divine soul in me sees and recognizes the divine soul in you, right? And uh, it's funny, over five years, it was like a gentle cleansing of my anger to the point where I literally have none. I got a little kitty cat sitting next to me, um, and she was uh, abused by her owner. And uh, she used to bite me up a lot. Now she's the most loving cat in the world. You know, um, what do I, what else do I have to say? But uh, um, that's my story. You know, whatever you guys can uh, get out of it, take what you need. Steve, thank you for sharing your story with us. If you don't mind me asking, prior to your NDE, why were you such an angry person? Good question. Uh, from Early childhood, I faced a lot of uh, childhood trauma, actual physical, psychological, and uh, I 
became a bully in school. Um, all the way through high school. Uh, in high school, I did drugs to try to get out what I was thinking. Um, got into recovery, but I was still angry. Because of one simple fact. Early on in my adolescence, everybody during the 1960s had a mindset toward people that were traumatized by abuse, or if a woman was raped, uh, we, we would be told, no, no, it never happened, when in fact it did. You know, um, today alone in the psychological community, that has totally changed. Now they're looking at the credibility of every single report of abuse. You know, I worked through a lot of my issues over the many years. Um, I've even, uh, you ever heard of a thing called uh, reparenting? I think so. Uh, reparenting is basically when you're an abuse victim, you try to reparent yourself. You know, do primarily what your parents didn't do for you or your, or your elders or whoever. In my case, really didn't want to reparent me. It was a bad, bad word in my mouth. So I call it inner child work. And I've taught this to numerous people, including my uh, former wife who just passed. And... All I can say, when you really get down to it and you just talk to your inner self as you, not like your parent, you know, not like you go clean your room now, you know, you talk to them as you from your own state of being, you can find so much peace and forgiveness there. Do you feel that it was this self-therapy that you were engaging in that relieved your anger or was it more due to the NDE? Well, all the people in my past that I, I hurt very badly and I forgive them um, very much. Come here. Come here. Here you go. Um, very much. Sorry about that. So my cat walking through. That's okay. Um, I had no concept of how it affected them, right? I had no concept at all. I was just beating somebody up, taking, you know, uh, whatever they had. But when I saw myself getting beat up by myself, the reality came through that I was not only hurting them, I was equally hurting myself. It was later that I developed the inner child work. And uh, with the two, I've learned, come on, come on. Yeah, it's daddy bottle, I gotta hold it. Come on, no, come on. You're gonna see a tail in a minute. Maybe, oh, yep. Yes. Yeah. He's fast. Um, in doing the inner child work and remembering of the uh, images that I saw of morphing into these people and being a bully, I learned one valuable lesson. As a bully, I was scared of the other people that I was trying to bully, right? And I didn't want to be, feel that fear. When I saw me beating up myself, I felt that fear in myself while I was beating myself up. And in an inner child work, I've, I've practiced forgiveness. I've practiced love. I've practiced uh, inner talk. You know, 
Um, it takes a lot of time to get over what you, you know, I've gone over. Um, and like I tell everybody at my events when I do the inner child stuff, that we have a little time where they have like maybe 20 to 30 minutes in the event to go out and just talk to their inner child. And uh, basically what I learned from my near-death experience primarily is it's one thing for somebody to forgive us. It's another thing to, for us to say, I forgive you, I love you, and I'm honored to be you. That goes to the deeper soul. Do you feel that the reason that you came back was to work through all this stuff or to teach people about what you've worked through and been through? Well, I did ask them, like I said, I said, uh, you know, I don't want to go back. And they said, you will in time. You will in time. But now you have a mission to complete. Are you ready to do that mission? And I said, yes. And so I've been sharing um, with a lot of people, been teaching my inner child work, and I still do uh, to whoever wants to, you know, get in contact with me if they're dealing with a problem of uh, some child trauma or even physical trauma from even a parent or an elder. Um, but here's the interesting fact. Back in 1982, okay, I found out that my kidneys were failing. And energetically speaking, your kidneys are the repository for your fear, the energy center for your fear. That's where the uh, sacrum chakra is, or the sacral chakra. And I developed a lot of kidney stones and I literally calcified the kidneys way back then. Doctors were saying, I'm gonna go on dialysis, I'm gonna go on dialysis, haven't been on dialysis yet. And slowly, progressively, my kidneys are now dropping out. Um, if anybody knows about uh, kidney failure, I'm in fourth stage renal failure. Uh, I have, uh, in what is called GFR, which is glomular filtration rate, which means I have 23% output out of 100. When it drops down to 15, I will be going on hospice. And graciously, I will be going home to the light. You know, I know that for a fact. I, I was told <laughs> not to push it. <laughs> but to go out joyously. Um, and I try my hardest to do that. Well, I, I don't even try my hardest. I just do it. Now, didn't these beings tell you that you're going to talk again or communicate again? Yes. Yes, they did. Are you communicating with them regularly? <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was funny. We were having a home event in Wenatchee. And I do talk to them regularly on a, like a, almost a moment to moment basis. Even my wife who passed uh, August of 2022. In a way, I talk to her in my heart. And she's right, like right with me. And people that, people, this is one thing that's really wonderful. We think that when a person passes from us, they're gone forever never to be seen again, right? That's further from the truth, Jeff. That's further from the truth. Our loved ones are right here with us. You know, as Dr. Wayne Dyer said, they just crossed over into the next room. You know, um, and when I got that thing where they, they started talking to me, I was in one of my events in Wenatchee, and I had a friend um, there ask one question. 
and the question that she asked was very specific to her. And I'm sitting there quietly, and they're going, don't say anything. We're going to speak. I'm like, seriously? <laughs> they're like, shut up. <laughs> and so I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to her question, which is, what do they want from me? What do they want me to be? Me to be? And they said this. They said, Sean Ku. Peace be, right? And my friend goes, oh, I'm always at peace, right? And I'm, I'm like, I'm kind of like a secretary taking dictation. And I told, I told my friend, I said, take at least 72 hours and the answer will, will come to you, okay? So I'm going through my town of Wenatchee to my favorite little uh, mid-morning, early morning restaurant, get my coffee and my breakfast. And she's there and she's flagging me down like a maniac. And she goes, after you get your coffee, come over here. I'm like, okay. <laughs> Got my coffee, ordered my breakfast. And I came over and she goes, who are you? I'm like, I'm me. She goes, the words you told me, which is exactly what they told her, was just peace be. She goes, you don't believe it. Yesterday, my friend blew up and right in my face and just started yelling at me for nothing. And the only thing that could come through was peace be. And she goes, how did you know? I'm like, I'm the I'm like pipe. The words that come through. You know. Well, it sounds like to me you were channeling. Pretty much, yes. Yeah. Have you done any more channeling since? I've done a few uh, sessions of channeling. Um, and honestly, the things that come through are definitely not me. You know. Um, and it's weird. I've literally had like, how do I explain it? I've had people, you know, I tell people after the session, whether it's in Seattle or wherever, you know, I give them my email address that I've channeled for, to, you know, for, or they accept a channel. And they email me, email me back with like, thank you. I mean, I mean, thank your channel, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, not that I'm better than M Abraham Hicks or any of those. You know, we're all doing the same thing. What is it like to speak without speaking? Because they told you not to speak, but eventually you started speaking. Well, imagine a dark stage. And you have a microphone on stage. There's nobody in the audience. But you know there are people in the audience. And there's a bar stool next to the microphone. And I'm always told to go sit on the microphone, even though my body's right in front of the microphone. So it's not like a split thing, but it's like I'm putting my, consci my consciousness on hold or my thoughts or my filters on hold and shutting those down, sitting on the bar stool and just and they're speaking through me, much like uh, Esther Hicks. You know, um, one thing that's interesting is I believe that, you know, there are a lot of people that um, hear all of us people have had NDEs, near-death experiences. And they think, well, if this person said this, that person said this, this person said this, right? Imagine a huge, gigantic diamond that has numerous facets all over it. Now, it is a diamond, and it has facets, and each of us NDEs are talking about one of the facets of the diamond. It's still a diamond, right? And each of us are talking from our truth 
of what we saw and heard. You know, so I can honestly uh, say that a I, I have no disagreements with any other person that has an NDE because we're all talking about the same light, whether we call it heaven or eternity or the universe or the infinite or nothingness. We're all talking about the same thing from a different angle. Do you think while you were at the hospital and you were on the other side, they had to restart your heart? I don't know what they did exactly, but I believe that's what they did because basically when I was in the trauma room alone, let me get a drink of water. Sure. When I was in the trauma room alone, they wanted to bring me into the operating room, but the three operating rooms were being used and they were backing up. So they literally shut down the trauma room and made it into an operating room. Uh, from what I know, and I've not been told of this, but I know, I believe that they did have to restart me because the doctor did say, oh, you're back with us. You know, so it must mean I went out again throughout the time that I was there. And then when they brought me up on the floor, to be, begin recuperation, I was in literally a two bed room, but they had to bring a whole bunch of equipment in to the room, which made it a one bedroom room. Furthermore, my forefinger here was the only thing that I could move. And so they literally taped the call light to my, my hand. And so I could press the button. And when I pressed the button, a doctor would come in, a nurse would come in, an RN, LVN, EMT, and CNA. All rushed into the room at the same time. And one, they'd be each checking machines out, um, checking tubes, uh, you know, stuff like that. Um, and... From what I hired an attorney um, about the accident, and uh, you know he's the one that told me about the uh, how far I moved the pole in the ground, and uh, did I die in that? I think my heart shunted, like, like, like not. Totally went dead, but just like like a short circuit. And so they had to use the paddles probably because I did have burn marks on my chest or kind of like compression marks on the paddles. If you can remember, was the other side more real than here? That is such a good question. And this may shock your audience. This world that we look at right now is so unreal because we're creating everything we see from up here. That side is so real. Um, it's funny, I have to say this. After my wife passed, I found her uh, unconscious in the bedroom, did CPR on her and was called off. And so I'm sitting on the couch here and um, the coroner left, the police left, fire department left. I'm alone, right? Trauma, trauma counselor left, and I'm all alone. And I literally heard my voice, physical voice, say, baby, you were right about this place. It is so beautiful here. Down here, we have a lot of anger. We have a lot of rage. We have a lot of hurt. And it's because we are hurting. Um, and it's like, if we could see, all of us see that side with an open heart, 
I believe our mindset would change. When you say that we're creating this world, mm -hmm. would you say that maybe 75% of the energy that we have um, manifest our reality around us. We're all doing it together, and then the rest is whatever we have left to survive. I believe it's a hundred percent creation of us. We create our own problems. We create our own circumstances. We create the illusion of life. You know, um, I guess you could say we create everything. We do. We do. A lot of people want to get that because they say, no, God's the creator. My sense of that is God is here. Right? And we choose to step away from God as ego, edging God out and creating the illusion of reality. Do you think we're supposed to come here and create problems in order to learn, or we're just mixed up and making mistakes because we could create a paradise here? Some of us are just creating mistakes for themselves. Some of us are uh, creating problems that, here's the, here's the caveat of that. And uh, Carolyn May said it best, we came here on contract from the light. And everybody we meet is on that soul contract with us. You know, I will meet you at a certain time on a certain date at a certain, you know, restaurant. And you'll spill your drink and I'll get mad and I'll run out, you know, sort of thing. And we think, oh, my God, this is happening. It was a crisis. It's a crisis. Truth is, there's nothing that needs to be controlled. It's interesting to think about that perhaps you and I made a soul contract to be together here right now. I believe so, along with everybody that uh, came to one of my events, everybody that um, everybody that does anything with anybody in the world that's in an interaction way, even if you're going into war, like you know that's happening all around the world now that is intentionally a soul contract. Now, it's hard to conceive, but I believe that's the reality of it. After your experience, did you notice that you had any new abilities that you didn't have prior that could be considered psychic? Um, channeling for one, uh, like, like I, I believe I told you, I was born empath, but I become like empath intuitive. So the two have blended because I had a, a dual brain injury. And good, good story here. I was once on Facebook. I had, I, I needed to get off because my health was starting to really go downhill, but I had a friend on Facebook and they told me that they were having a migraine really bad migraine they couldn't stand it anymore they were thinking about going to the hospital now here's the thing i live here in washington state they lived out in florida never met them from adam except on facebook that's how we interacted i said do you mind if i uh uh give you some energy healing they're like please do and so I started, you know, just going into a meditation and energy healing for him. And he's going, whoa, 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 dude, whoa, whoa, dude, dude, stop, stop. I'm like, what, what, are you hurting more? And he goes, no, it's like my, my migraine has been sapped out. How'd you do that? And I told him, well, I was sitting in the blue chair in your living room. And he looked at me and goes, how do you know I have a blue chair? I never saw his living room until I saw that in my, in my mind. And since blue I like is, the, is my favorite color, I decided to sit down in that chair. How are you inspired by your experience? Oh, another good question. Um, each and every moment, 
as I wake up, I'm no longer inspired to go to say something like, oh, God, it's morning. Oh, I need a coffee. I'm inspired to go, wow, this is a cool thing, man. And then I get my coffee and I get up, fix myself some breakfast or whatever. And it moves me on into the day. Come here. Come here. Come here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Side, side, side. And it moves me on into the day. Um, I was just talking to a neighbor friend at the apartments. And um, we were talking about uh, uh, being at peace. And how I feel about this peace and all is like a little helium balloon that's slightly defaded. And in the morning, you pump it up and it fills up just enough for that moment. Right? And then the next moment, you pump it up and it, it's peace that enfolds you. And I'm inspired uh, to, since basically, you know, I, I don't know my end date of when I'm going to leave this earth, but I'm inspired to do one thing. I came into this world angry, pissed off, mean, hostile. Now, I think there's enough of that in the world today. I'm going to go out peacefully. You know, with peace and love for everybody, no matter who they are. After watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Yes, I am uh, through email. Right. And so uh, you can please uh, offer them my email. You want to say it? Yeah. Okay, what is it? Stephen Lavoy 557 at gmail.com. That's S T E V E N L A V O I E, the number five, the number five, seven at gmail.com. Do you have a website or anything? I do not. No, no. I'm primarily, what I'm doing is I'm slowly shutting down more speaking engagements, going out to big events and all, and more doing one on one with people as long as I can, you know, physically can. Um, but yeah, sorry, no website. It's okay. Do you have a book or anything else? I do not No. Okay. Well, before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Remember this, each of us are loved. And that's all we are primarily from our soul our physical being we are love if we do anything less than that we not only hurt us but the world around us peace and namaste steven thank you for your message and thank you for being my guest thank you for having me thanks for watching the jeff mara podcast I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.